Let's talk about walls that work. Hi everybody, welcome to Talk and Chalk. I'm Beck. If you're new to the channel, welcome and thank you to all of my regular subscribers. If you haven't hit that notification bell below to get a notification that I've put up a video, tap on that and you won't miss anything. If you're new here, I don't sell, I don't spam, I do videos once a week and the aim is just to help teachers with, well, whatever topic arises. So if you want to make a suggestion for a video, just pop it in the comments below. If you are watching this in uh, Twitter or U uh, YouTube, <laughs> if you're watching this in Twitter or Facebook, you'll need to open this up into YouTube to be able to see the comments below. If people have other suggestions or if you want to leave a comment as well, happily to engage in conversation. Or if you want to hit me up on social media, I will share those here while I continue rambling for a little while. Uh, thank you to those people that have been patient with me. You can hear in my voice, I'm still not 100% at the moment and it feels like forever since I did a video, even though I only skipped one week. Time flies, I suppose, when you're coughing up all sorts of things into the bin. Moving on. So today I wanted to talk to you guys really quickly because I know a lot of you are slammed with reports, so I won't take up too much time today about walls that work. This came up in conversation recently with a colleague of mine who came to me and I love the fact that this colleague is very open about the things that they feel they need to improve on and said, I don't think the kids are using the displays that are in the classroom. I don't think they're utilizing them. Why aren't the kids going to them? Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. The kids aren't using them. And my first question was, did the kids help make them? Did the kids contribute to them or are these things that you have just printed off, laminated and stuck up on the wall? And the answer was printed, laminated and stuck up on the wall. So I thought this is not a rare thing. This is something I come acro across quite often. And you would have seen in my other videos about setting up a classroom, my personal experiences, expectations and benefits from the way that I set up my walls by incorporating student input into this. So I'm just going to go through some examples today of, you know, how you do this, why you do this, ways that you can do this and why it's beneficial for the kids. So, um, I mean, I might show you just an example first. I, I just decided to type in, um, walls in classrooms into Google and I typed in walls at work. And I also typed in Pinterest classroom to see what would come up. This is one of the examples that I found, and I'm not doing this to shame anyone. You do what works best for your kids, but I know that this would not work well for my kids. So this room here, you can see this particular wall is really, it's cluttered. A lot of the stuff that has been printed out is quite small. And I, even though there's things like these blue backgrounds and things, it doesn't quite segment it for the eye very well. And the fact that this doesn't look like a photo that's taken from the back end of the room. I can only see a little bit of the floor there. So this is quite close. Now, if I, as a teacher in the room, can't see that stuff, the kids can't see it, it just becomes a mess that sits in the background. And if there's nothing there inviting them to come up and utilize it, it's just going to be a wasted resource. In this particular one as well, it looks like everything is just printed um, from an external website. They could have been created as well um, and then stuck up there. <clears throat> I can hear my toddler knocking at the door now. <laughs> He's saying, bye, mama. <laughs> oh, dear. See if he stays. Anyway, um, this kind of thing, though, the kids have less connectedness to it than what they would have if they had been part of that creation process. For all I know, this teacher typed it with the kids and it looks beautiful and it's laminated and it's stuck up there. Um, however, in terms of displaying it, though, it's not necessarily interactive for the kids to use that. Um, I found some really good examples, though, and I'm just trying to scroll across now. Um, sorry, moving over. This one is really good. It looks blended. So I'm going to pause for a second while my son has a cry. Okay. He's off playing with his sister now. All sorted. So back to the example. This is an example of one. It's a bit hard to see there, but you can see at the top here, there's stuff where the kids have written little comments on the sides here. I can see whiteboards that are I'm hoping that's student writing, otherwise it's a teacher with possibly not the neatest writing. Um, but the kids have put things on there as well. Some things are colored in, some things are printed. This is a good blended segment where the kids have obviously contributed to it. There's a chance that they are going to point that out to their parents when they come into the classroom and I did that and I did that. They're going to remember that experience as well as the teacher 
putting in the things that they want to drive through there as well in terms of content or whatever um, prompts they want to have for those students. That's a really good example. So, <coughs> excuse me, I really need to emphasize you don't have to have that, you know, that Pinterest beautiful room. You can keep things looking beautiful in your room and still have kids contribute to it. So that's what I'm going to go through now. So the idea for me or what I found is just consistency for the eye is what would bring the kids attention back to it. So uh, you might use um, cards that have similar borders or similar colors. So your maths might be in one particular color with variants, you know, light blue to dark blue. It can still all be blue or shades of blue or cool colors. And then, you know, might have literacy things in sort of those warmer colors or just, you know, orange or something like that, keeping it consistent. So at least it draws the eye to it. The kids can still contribute. They just happen to be doing it in blue or orange textures. And you can guide that. You All you've got to do is say, use these textures, guys, and only put out different blue textures. Um, that's what they'll choose from. And that's what will be on that display when you put it up. Um using borders around it as well. So you might have everything that's um, focused on a particular writing prompt that you're using and you've just got one certain border around it. So it segments it from the other things that you have in the room. And it's, oh, my light just went out. Oh my gosh, issues today. <clears throat> I'm gonna keep losing my voice as I go on. <laughs> Sorry guys. So. Um, having those segments are important for kids with any kind of sensory issues, optical issues where they need gaps between things to be able to allow their eyes to focus in on that one thing. And I don't mean that the border is the segment. I mean that you have, you know, a border, but you border around one thing, you border around another thing between those borders still needs to be a little bit of a gap so that the eyes can focus, um, and even kids that don't have a diagnosed condition around their eyes, their sight, or, you know, how they focus on things, it still helps them. And it helps keeps your walls neat and tidy. Um, you know, your room is still on display. You want it to look appealing, uh, which is part of the appeal, I guess, of the Pinterest rooms with the rainbow and the themes and everything like that. And if you're someone who likes those things, it's not a problem with that. Um, it's just more about making sure that you're doing it in a way that, you know, enhances our student learning and it's not there purely for aesthetics. Um, I like that blended combination of using something of your own and something from the kids. So a good example of that was a word wall that I used in my classroom. Um, I did not laminate these um, because I'm trying to move towards, uh, you know, the whole less plastic, being more env environmentally friendly, but also because laminated stuff falls apart anyway if you're using it over and over and over again. So I would just use thick card. So I would have my base list of uh, words that I wanted to use for my word wall segmented into their, you know, letters, A, B, C, D, yada, 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 and put them on there. And then anytime we would come across that new word that I wanted to put on the wall, I would have the same card that I had used printed in the same, uh, sorry, cut out in the same size but I would get the kid to write it. So it becomes a teachable moment. So we've come across this word. We don't know how to spell it. Um, let's go through the strategies of spelling it. So whatever you're focusing on with your kids, teaching them that strategy and then identifying ways that you can spell that even around the room. You know, who else knows this word? Is it in our book? Is it in the dictionary? All those sorts of things, as well as, you know, the sounding out and chunking and splitting and all that kind of thing. And then the kid puts it on the card, they write it, and they physically get to go up and pin it into the wall. They find that letter, they pin it into the wall. Um, because for some kids, seriously, kids love pinning things into walls. It's a big deal for them sometimes. I don't know why, I have no theory behind it or research behind it, but they do. So let them pin it into the wall. And I guarantee you, those kids wanna show it off. I got to write this on the wall today. Did you say I found a new word? I put it on the wall today. They get to contribute. They feel proud of what they're doing. And even if you want to put their name, you know, in the corner or on the back of it or something so that you remember which kids contributed to it, you can kind of monitor that. That's almost a bit of um, tracking, I guess, where you can check that later, you know, how many kids have contributed to the word wall. And eventually you'll end up with a word wall that has a combination of the things that you started with and what they've added to it. It's also a good way for you to track what you've added to it because you can see all the handwriting that's on there as opposed to all the printing that you started with. Um, another thing that I did with that word wall is the letters that I had. So there were these flowery little letters that I printed from Twinkle, I think, or something like that. They were color coded. <clears throat> 
I then I, I shrunk the, I enlarged them for the wall and then I shrunk them down for kids to have little mini flip books so it would have the little letter on the side and a strip of paper stapled together and then they would have their own little word book that matched our word wall so when they came across a new word not only would they add it to the wall they'd add it to their little book as well and then that color coding and the, the visual representation of the letter that matched the wall was a bit of connectedness for them as well to just enhance that reasoning and um, and patterns. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, guys. It's such a dry throat. Um, the other recommendation I have about those resources is rotating them. So the word wall, rotating those words out. You know, once those kids know them and you've got that, you know, um, assessment that says, yes, the kids know all these words, take them off. What's the point of having them up there if they don't need them? If you've got those few kids that still need them, that's when you need to have a targeted resource for that child that I recommend is on their desk. So it's important to have fluid resources as well. So having something, it is, I just said, you know, things that are laminated will fall apart. Be prepared for it to fall apart. But hey, if kids are using it and that's why it's falling apart, that's not necessarily a bad thing. So things like um, desk charts and stuff like that. I've got them. I don't care if they're neat and tidy. Kids use them. They can move around the room wherever they want. Um, and I have a video where I show those. I think it's in my 360 degree classroom video where I show you like a bit of a tour of my classroom that I had for you too. And I show you all those resources and you can see they're, they're starting to fall apart. They're crinkly and folded and that kind of a thing. But the kids use them. That's the difference. Um, so it, think of your walls as a bit of a working document. So just like our programs that are constantly changing, just like our kids' books are constantly changing and the things that we do, those walls should be a work in progress as well that rotate around really. Like whatever you've got at the beginning of the year should not be there at the end of the year. Um, and when you've got things like beautiful artworks and stuff like that, sticking them up there all year long, I know some of you like to keep it to store into an art folder at the end of the year. It's not a problem, but I put it into a folder, put it like use it for a term, put it into a plastic sleeve, keep it in a safe place, bring it out at the end of the year to put into the folder for the end of the year to send home. Um, I'll take photos. So you've got them stored up to you, whatever works better for you. Um, so the, the most important thing too, as well as with all of these resources is making sure you're referring to it. The kids aren't going to use it if you're not using it as well. So I'm going to go back to the word wall as an example. Um, you know, when something comes up, remember, Cindy wrote that word. We know this word. It's up here. Point to it. Go to it. Use it. Make that connection for them. And then, <coughs> so sorry, and make sure that you're moving around the room as well. If you've got stuff up the back of the classroom, but you're constantly teaching from the front, the kid's habit is to look that direction, not to twist around and look behind them for that resource. So, and that's why I set up my classroom as a 360 degree classroom. There was no front, there was no back. Learning happened everywhere. We were always moving around. Um, and this comes from having a flexible learning environment as well, um, which not everyone can do, I know. But flexible learning is a bit different to flexible spaces. So you can still create that, um, that experience for them as well. And if you've got those um, resources that are fluid, they can take them off the walls. They're allowed to take it off. They're allowed to stick it back up again. Kids know it's interactive and they're allowed to engage with it. A lot of the time kids think they're just not allowed to touch it. And sometimes we blatantly say, don't touch that. That's fine. Set up your own rules and expectations around behavior and what they can and can't do. Um, I also recommend in terms of those things that you want to keep up in terms of display as opposed to learning with, make them higher. GAs will go in and put up string and rope and things like that. Um, and if you're not allowed to stick things up, because I know not all schools let you do that, I use the 3M hooks. It's the stuff that has the sticky stuff behind it and a hook and it can it can hold really heavy stuff. And as long as you pull it correctly, it will come off the wall, not ripping anything, not ruining the paint or anything like that. I tied up 3M hooks. I just use twine, hang it across, and then I use pegs to hang it up. Too easy. Um... I think I've covered that. Take it to the desk. So we're going to finish off then just with this reinforcement about why. So I've just told you how I did different things and I'm sure you can come up with more creative things than me as well. But why are we trying to incorporate the kids in this? Why are we trying to make it flexible um, and being able to move things around like that? So it's, it's more memorable for them. Kids remember little things like that. Don't don't underestimate the little moments that they love. They will remember the smallest things sometimes through for many years afterwards. 
It helps them retain the information more by building up that connectedness, having more of an experience with it, jumping onto that teachable moment where you're not just saying, this is the word, it's up on the wall if you need it. Creating that experience means that they retain it better. Uh, I've said before, they, they, they will want to show it off. The fact that they want to show it off means they're proud of it, they'll remember it, they'll engage with it, and then they'll put it into some other work that they're doing. They'll build up that um, reciprocity in their, in their uh, learning. Um, it allows for student voice into their work, and this is a focus that I have this year for um, some of my professional goals around the Aspiring Principals program, is student voice, allowing kids to have more than a say over, what game do we want to play this afternoon? Actually allowing them to have a voice over their learning, how they're learning, um, not just what they're learning, but how they're doing it and, and why they like doing it that way. And that comes into our outcomes too. We need kids to give us feedback. They need to give feedback and they need to have some ownership over this. And that builds into the best part as well. It enables independence. This is a great structure to building to independence. We guide them through that process where we create the resource, we put it up, we remind them how to use it. And then eventually they'll get to the point where they'll just go use it or they'll extend themselves and find another way to learn something. They'll find another way to get their information and it might not be from something they created. It might be from something that some other kid created that got all excited and showed their friend, I made this one. I remember Johnny made that thing about maths. I'm going to go use his thing to learn. That's the best part when they're utilizing someone else's resource for their learning independently because they've built up those relationships and structures and practices. And that's the best part of all when they get independent with their learning. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I hope this was useful for you guys. If you've got any other strategies, please put them in the comments below so that anyone who's watching can scroll down and have a look. Um, I'm also going to leave in the description below um, a link to the On Butterfly Wings conference, which is happening these next school holidays. And I'm very excited because it's going to be my very first keynote presentation. It's going to be about collaboration. And I'm also going to be presenting two of the workshops there, one on CV writing, one on guided reading, but there are also tons of other workshops and some of them are Nessa registered. So head over to educationrevolution.com.au. I will link it there below for the On Butterfly Wings conference. It's going to be so much fun and I hope you guys can all come. I'm going to leave it there though. So I'm going to put my subscription button down below. Just hover over that, click to subscribe. I'll put another one of my videos at the top there and make sure you check out the playlists that I've set up for you guys to try and make it easier to find videos now that there's so much in there. See you later. Bye.